This is Senior Meteorologist Sam Lashley with the National Weather Service Northern Indiana office. This is going to be a short video presentation looking at the upcoming 2018 and 19 winter as well as a local historical perspective based on previous winters. We are currently in an El Nino watch status. This is expected to become an advisory as we go through the winter. But essentially it means that currently we expect a 70 to 75 percent chance that El Nino will form this winter and we think it will be at the top of a weak category for El Ninos near the low end moderate range. The Climate Prediction Center currently indicates for December through February that there are nearly equal chances for temperatures and precipitation to fall into the above normal, below normal, or near normal categories. Now as you stop laughing at that and saying, well, anybody can forecast that, we're going to talk about what that actually means and hopefully show you the uncertainties there are in forecasting for the long range and why that actually means something statistically. The latest long range models for the next three months do favor above normal temperatures and normal to below normal precipitation for this period. However, since 1950, looking at previous weak El Nino events, and there have been nine of them, they've produced on average below normal temperatures and near to slightly below normal precipitation. So there's some of that discrepancy that's creeping into the forecast that leads to that uh, equal chances for temperatures and precipitation, and we'll talk more about that coming up. It's important to remember that below normal precipitation does not mean below normal snowfall. I'll remind you of a couple winters in the 70s, 1976, 77, and 77, 78. I think we all remember those winters well. Big blizzards, very cold temperatures, a lot of snow, but temperatures were well below normal and precipitation was below normal in most of those winters. So there is no skill in predicting snowfall. There's just too many variables there. It can be measured differently. Uh, just a few degrees or a few hundredths of an inch of liquid can make all the difference in the world. So we really focus on temperatures and precipitation when forecasting on the seasonal time scale. The official national winter outlook from the Climate Prediction Center shows basically equal chances for those categories across most of our area. The exception being in the north there where we're just slightly into the above normal favored range and we're going to show those percentages and, and show why they're not very high. Similar for precipitation, the equal chances except in the far north and when we downscale this map locally this helps explain it a little bit more. So for four cities across our area the top row of pie charts here shows the probabilities that temperatures will fall into those three categories. The bottom row similar for precipitation. So as you can see at South Bend and Benton Harbor the percentage for above normal is just 34 percent. That's just really not enough to sway us to think it's going to be warmer than normal because of that slightly higher percentage. But you have to draw the line somewhere so to speak. So for all intents and purposes, equal chances across the area for those temperatures to be in those three categories. Very similar for precipitation, but just slightly higher percentages there in the below normal category, 35 to 36% across the north. And we actually, based on some previous El Ninos, will show, um, we think that actually has a better chance of occurring over this coming winter. So there is no strong signal in what we look at for forecasting on a seasonal time scale. That's the main reason why these percentages are all in the similar categories. There's nothing to really hang our hat on. So we want to kind of look at what will be driving our winter. But before we get there, let's quickly take a look at what the models are forecasting for the next three months. And what you just need to focus on, each one of these squares are different computer models and their percentages that they're showing for uh, temperatures. And the reds and the oranges are where the models think uh, there are better chances for it to be warmer than normal. And the whites and the blues are near normal to below normal. So you see a lot of orange and reds on these maps. And only on the bottom few maps do you see some whites and blues indicative of forecast of normal to below normal temperature. So the Climate Prediction Center is sort of favoring those warmer models for the upcoming months. We look at precipitation, similar patterns. The greens and blues are where precipitation could be above normal. The reds and oranges below normal. 
So we see a variety across these maps, but there is a tendency to lean towards the below normal precipitation groups with the orange and reds across the Great Lakes region. So as I said, we're expecting a weak El Nino this winter, um, but what is an El Nino and what does that mean? And it's simply in the equatorial Pacific, the water temperature, sea surface temperatures as we call them, are above normal for an extended period of time. And uh, we have some computations we look at to de decide the official definition of an El Nino when it occurs and when it becomes official, but we're not going to worry about that in this presentation. Um, the trade winds across the equator sort of shift and uh, blow in the opposite direction. And all this together then affects where convection develops in the ocean area, and that affects where the jet stream patterns take over for the winter. So this favors a stronger than normal jet stream across the southern United States, which makes it uh, much wetter in that area. And uh, we tend to be drier and warmer on average for El Ninos. But for weak El Ninos, that's not necessarily the case, as I'll show here shortly. So the largest impacts do occur with the stronger El Ninos, and that's what everybody seems to, to remember. But these weaker events uh, can, be, can be influenced by other patterns across the globe, and we call those teleconnection patterns. And I'll explain that in the next slide, what they mean. But essentially, they can overwhelm a weak El Nino signal, and they can dominate for our winter season. So a teleconnection pattern is simply a, a change in the atmosphere and the jet streams across the globe. And those patterns can influence temperature, rainfall, and storm tracks over very large geographical areas. So two teleconnections that we look at and you might hear uh, on the local media are the Arctic Oscillation, or the AO, and the North Atlantic Oscillation, the NAO. When these are in what we call the negative phase, they allow very cold Arctic air to dive south into the central part of the North America and the Northern Hemisphere, really. Uh, this can affect Asia and Europe as well. But in the United States, it tends to favor very cold temperatures and snowy conditions in the eastern half of the United States. When those indices are positive, that keeps the cold air locked up across the Arctic, where it uh, many believe it belongs, and we tend to be more mild across the central part of the northern hemisphere. Unfortunately, the AO and NAO can really only accurately be predicted out one to two weeks in the future, but they can have a significant impact on our weather for the entire winter season. So we're constantly looking at these indices to forecast the next one to three to four weeks out. As I mentioned, the El Nino strength is expected to be around a, a one, which is the top of the weak category. If you look at this diagram of different model forecasts, the red and green line there in the very center of those different model plots is sort of the average, and that averages out at about a one degree anomaly for this El Nino winter. When we look at these weak El Nino events that have occurred, we can also come up with these composite anomaly maps, or departure from normals. And this map looks at those weak El Nino events when that Arctic Oscillation was positive. And when the two of those are joined that way, we see definite trend towards above normal temperatures across a large part of the United States. And for our local area, we're slightly above normal to normal in years of weak El Ninos when the AO averages positive over the entire winter. On the flip side, when that AO becomes negative, the entire eastern half of the United States tends to be cold and quite cold with significant Arctic intrusions of air down across the United States. This was the case in 1976-77 and 77-78 that led to the very cold winter and the big blizzards across the eastern part of the United States. For precipitation during those positive AO events, we tend to get more moisture because the atmosphere is warmer, it can hold more, we get more rainfall events, so precipitation trends above normal. Again, on the flip side, with the negative AO, we're colder, there's less moisture to work with, so precipitation on average trends below normal, but again, snowfall can be above normal because we're getting a lot fluffier snow with the drier precipitation rates, and uh, so you get that fluffy snow that really piles up very quickly. 
So we'll transition here and looking at past El Nino events and how they've affected our local weather. This is just a list of all the El Nino events since 1950 and you can see the nine El Nino events we've used for our local study based on the Oceanic Nino Index or ONI when it was less than a one for the winter season. So here are those composite maps for each El Nino from 1950 to 1978. Feel free to pause this presentation and look at this more in depth, but you can definitely see for several of these events a trend towards colder than normal. Uh, the exception there, 1953-54, that was warmer than normal. And on the far right is a composite of those first five charts that show the averages over those years. We'll look ahead to 1979 to 2015 events. There were four for this, and not quite as cold in these events. Um, but when you look at the composite on the far right, definitely averages out below normal temperatures. And then similar graphs here for precipitation departures, and you can definitely see a trend towards normal or drier than normal uh, when these ONIs were less than one. The composite on the far right, again, is just an average of those other five maps. Looking ahead, 1979 to 2015 then, uh, we have a little bit more of a wet trend in a couple of these El Ninos, and so that averages out to near normal, uh, with just a strip there across the central parts of Indiana, where it averages slightly above normal for precipitation. Taking this down further on the local scale, we'll look at climate divisions. So in Indiana, 1, 2, and 3 across the north, and Michigan, 8 and 9 in the southwest, and in Ohio, northwest climate division 1. We look at averages of those nine events for all weather observation sites within those climate divisions, and here you see a drastic trend of below normal temperatures in the winter during these weak El Nino events for all those climate divisions. And keep in mind, those 1970 winters, if we subtract those out and look at this, we're still below normal, but we're about half of this departure. We're around 1.5 degrees below normal when you take out those very, very cold 1970 years. Precipitation averages just slightly below normal, but every climate division is below normal on average based on past weak El Nino events, and that trend does continue into the spring. We'll break it down further here, and again, feel free to pause the presentation to look at these in more in depth. But monthly temperature departures by climate division, you can definitely see from October to even into March, on average, every climate division has average below normal for temperatures, and uh, that's a pretty strong signal there when you look at it monthly. And precipitation, these winters tend to start out the late fall and early winter dry, January averages a little above normal, then back below normal for February, but a back above normal in March. And then just for uh, interesting tidbits here, we go ahead and look at snowfall, reminding you there is no skill in uh, correlation, but we do see a trend of above normal snowfall in these events. Uh, especially in January and February, despite the below normal precipitation at times. So again, just reinforces that you can get above normal snowfall with below normal precipitation. Taking it further here, we look at uh, event by event for those snowfall, and you really see prior to 1980, a lot of snowfall departures above normal. And then after 1980, still above normal, but not to the extent that we were early on in the 70s. So putting this all together for our local outlook and thoughts, we expect alternating periods of warm and cold weather through the winter. When that AO and NAO are positive, we're going to trend warmer with higher chances for rainfall more than likely. And when they're negative, we'll become very cold with higher chances for snowfall more than likely. Based on these weak and even moderate El Nino analogs, we think locally there's a little better chance for this winter to see below normal temperatures and below normal precipitation. However, as I mentioned several times, this could lead to above normal snowfall despite the below normal precipitation. There have been several weak El Nino winters since 1950 that have produced significant snowfall, especially in January and February. We've seen very, very big events, high snowfall amounts. Um, and this is partly because of the last bullet there, the jet stream along the southern United States can come north 
and it's stronger than normal and it can bring moisture north and if temperatures are cold we can get big snow if temperatures are warm we can see an anomalous high rainfall event so we do have to keep that in mind that we can see big precipitation events despite that drier than normal signal so once again in summary El Nino is expected officially climate prediction center basically has equal chances for temperatures and precipitation hopefully you've seen uh, the difference between the models and what we've seen in the past and by no means is the past an indication of a, a future forecast but it is something that puts uh, things into perspective for us and uh, we like to use those analogs so we appreciate you taking the time to listen to this forecast and outlook for the winter season we hope you have a safe and enjoyable winter season and we'll look for you in the spring.